hundred percent dad interviews with dads. Uh, you introduce yourself, name, occupation, marriage, kids, all that jazz. Yeah, uh, I'm Charlie Collins. Uh, married, uh, going on almost twenty years now. Got seven kids, uh, ranging from college age down to four. Um, occupation, I just I do a little bit of everything. Just came out with a, a game app, Roll of Fortune, and um, and that's kind of what I've been working on for the last quarter year. And I also do property management and um, you know just different stuff like that. Yeah, which is how we met. Yeah. Rent, yeah. Renting an office from you. So 20 years. How old's your oldest kid? 20. She's 20 years old. Okay, so you got married and ready to have a kid. Well, uh, we adopted our oldest, too. Okay. Yeah. So how long were you married before you had kids? We were probably married two years, two or three years. Okay. Yeah. So you got a little normalcy together before you introduced. Yeah. Seven. It was... It was uh, a little normalcy you know you kind of those first years you're you know you kind of wonder you know should we have kids yet and all that kind of stuff but uh um you know god just he he provided this uh opportunity to adopt foster kids that were actually in our church and they kind of grew up in our church so it was it was really kind of neat um the foster family mom and dad they were the choir directors at our church and stuff like that and so it, it was kind of a, it was all a God thing. He just provided an open door. So the first kids you had were adopted then? Uh, our first two kids, yeah. Okay. And then I think during that whole adoption process, my wife got pregnant with our third. Okay. So, so it was like three kids all at once. Happens fast. Yeah. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> Baptism by fire. Our fir first two kids, you know, they're the guinea pigs. Okay. You know, we don't know what we're doing. And then, you know, we have to learn on them. So <laughs> so, I, so I've always heard, I've always read, heard, uh, if you can go about a year, uh, first year of marriage, uh, without having any major changes, without buying a house, without changing jobs, without, you know, any big moves, having kids would be included, um, that it would be, it's, it's a tremendous thing to your marriage to be able to just adjust to living together for that first year. I, you know, uh, getting married, it's been 20 years ago for me. So it's, you know, times kind of made it hazy a little bit, but, uh, yeah, there is a big adjustment period. Um, you know, but when God says it's time to have kids and, you know, who's going to argue with that? And, uh, um, but yeah, you got finances, finances, and you've got just getting used to each other. Who, who, yeah, you know, who has the? I think that's the big part. Yeah, exactly. All that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, it's an adjustment. The way the one guy told me, the weird things you think are cute when you first get married, you know, five, ten years down the line, are going to be the things that drive you the most crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I can, I can kind of see that. Um, but uh, I'm sure my wife would say the same thing. Oh yeah. Absolutely. All right. So seven kids. Um, plus you're like seven feet tall. How tall are you? I'm six nine. Not close enough. Yeah. Yeah. Three inches away. But I told my kids, I'm like, like it's not very often I walk into a room and I like, have to look up to someone. <laughs> yeah, me either. And they're like, did he play basketball? I'm like, I'm sure at one point he played basketball. I Everybody mean. asks me that. And I always ask them, well, yeah, I did. But did you play miniature golf? Yeah. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Uh, where's it going with that? All right, seven kids, two adopted, then you had one. What, what came next? And this, so that was like three kids. Yeah, that was like three all kids one time. all at once. So you're gonna make you're gonna kind of put me on the spot here because I don't have the best memory. I'm okay. just like, yeah, they're my kids. But yeah, uh, the next one, uh, let's see, probably two or three years later, we had okay. another biological child. Okay. Um, and the oldest two were they twins or same age? They they're a year almost exactly a year apart. Okay, but yeah, they they get so what they were like two and one when you adopted them, uh, two and three, two and three. something okay. like that, three and four. I think by the time we adopted them, you know, there was a long process. So, but think about actually by the time we adopted them, I think they were three and four. Okay, so three, four, then an infant, and then yeah. a year later another. Yeah, well, okay. yeah. So, um, and then a couple, of, uh, probably about seven years ago. Um, I went on a mission trip uh, seven or eight years ago. I went on a mission trip to Africa, and God just—I mean, He just wrecked my life over there. I don't know; it's hard to explain. 
But uh, I came back and I wasn't really the same person. I don't know if you've ever had that kind of experience, but I knew God was calling me to do something. I just didn't know what it was. And it was this probably a year long journey of trying to figure out what, what he wanted that ended up leading up to uh, adopting our two daughters from Uganda, Africa. Um, so that was... Uh, Which are two daughters after you've do- adopted two and had your own. So yeah. this is kids f- uh, what, four and five. Yeah, yeah. F- no, five and six. Okay, because you had two six. kids then. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, so we, had, we went over there, adopted them, and that, that's very simplified. So, yeah. So why did you go on a mission trip? I wasn't going to go. I felt like God called me going to Africa sometime in my life. You mm-hmm. know, I was, I've, I've always, you just always felt that way or like, I've just like maybe for five, five years before this or something uh-huh. like that. I just, I've uh, is this really been into missions. I've always it, been into Is this missions. something your church did regularly? So it was kind of no, like always. It wasn't not Africa. My okay. sister decided to lead a team and uh, to Africa. And I thought, man, that would be kind of cool, but it's not really in something I can do right now and I remember this I was I was in Sunday school and I I uh, heard some kids some youth out in the lobby and I thought you know what I'm gonna go send them to class they should be in class so I go out there and there were no kids out there but there was this old man named Bill out there and uh, and he said hey Charlie have you heard about this mission team going to Africa and I said yeah I have and he said you know what there's there's only women going on that team. They need a man. They need a man to go on the team. He said, I'll pay your way if you go. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, okay. And, uh, and I went and it was like, you know, no, I've been on a ton of mission trips and this is one of them that normally you're building houses. You're, you know, helping people that are poor and, and things like that. This one was all spirit led. It was spiritual. It was like, you're going to hospitals praying for people. Okay. Um, you're, I mean, it was just one thing after another. People getting healed. People, we went to a prison, uh, shared the gospel at the prison. There's like 180 men and women that came to Christ that day. It was just, I mean, one thing after another. And it was like, by the time I was, we were done, I was just like, I, God has shown me so much here. I can't leave here unchanged, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I didn't know what I was supposed to do. You know, I just didn't know what God wanted me to do with that. I ended up writing a book. It's called Mukaka's House that goes through all of that. And uh, Mukaka, my daughter's native tongue, means uh, grandma. And so the, okay. the actual name of the book is Grandma's House. And I want, wanted to write that so my kids can remember God's faithfulness. He wasn't just faithful to the, to the orphans and the, and the kids that we went originally and helped. He wasn't just faithful to the, to the people in the hospital that had been praying to be healed and then God healed them. He wasn't just faithful to my daughters that were in an orphanage. And he wasn't just faithful to their grandma that had been praying that they that they wouldn't that they'd have a place to live, and he wasn't just faithful to us. I mean, he was faithful to all of us at the same time, and uh, that that that's something only God can do. I mean, it's amazing, and I wanted them to see that God is faithful, no matter what, no matter what circumstance. He's so big; he can be faithful to everybody at the same time, and it it, it was. Uh, God's faithfulness is the point of that book, and and I want my kids to remember that. Is that a like a fiction book based on like your experiences, or is that like a uh, that's like a diary? I mean, a that, diary, of what that, you did. Yeah, that's okay. exactly it, it. And that's one thing I wrote down. I was like, I don't want to glamorize. I don't want to over you know write something. This is going to be something that I mean that really happened that I that I stand behind. And I do. I stand behind that book, and and God really worked uh, through our team and through the missionaries that were there. It was pretty amazing. So when you go on a mission, uh, you answered half my questions. One, I guess you have to pay your way. Uh, you, you obviously had someone volunteer to do it for you. Uh, the second is, I guess, you have to kind of put your life on pause. And at this point, you have a wife and kids, I'm assuming. Uh, you definitely did. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
and uh, some sort of career. So I guess how do you handle that? Like, because uh, I don't even know how long you're going for mission. I don't know if this is like a five day mission or if this is a five month mission. But uh, well, walk, walk me through that. Yeah, for uh, for our team, it was a two week mission. Okay. And and a lot of times they're. Uh, a lot of times mission teams go for maybe a weekend or a long weekend or a week. So two week mission was pretty long for me. Um, and so it kind of just depends on, on who's leading the team, what the, what the actual mission is for that team mm -hmm. and things like that. But, um, so like down in Louisiana, um, when Hurricane Katrina went through, there was tons and tons of teams that went down but they may only go for a week and when they sure. leave the next one picks up right where they left off right and stuff like that so our team and i get those make more sense and are logistically easier yeah um africa on the other yeah, hand africa, a little more challenging africa, big ocean though. It, it took us because of flight delays and everything going on it ended up taking us i think i think it was 52 hours after everything it normally takes around 30 but that time and i couldn't sleep i'm so big you know, I just yeah. couldn't, what am I going to do? Lean over on everybody? You know, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I'm big, I'm uncomfortable in those seats Yeah, and I'm what, seven inches shorter than you. So it I was, think I would have just laid in the hallway until someone yelled at me. Yeah. I, I couldn't, I couldn't sleep. And so by the time we got there, it's daylight when we landed, it was daylight. So they have us doing stuff. Boom. I mean, they, this, the missionaries there were amazing. They just had us boom, going and going and going and going. And, uh, and so I was so tired that first day, I couldn't even hardly keep my eyes open. And by the end of the mission, I couldn't sleep on a plane, but I ended up being able to sleep in the van going over huge potholes and bouncing up and down. And, and by the time I was going home, I could sleep on the van. It was like peaceful, you know? Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. But yeah, uh, so I, I encourage anybody that has an opportunity to go on a mission trip, if God's calling you to do it, you know, put put your life on pause. So, how, how do you manage to, I guess, get away from work for that long? Well, I work for my mom and dad, so that was oh, a that benefit. Helps, yeah, yeah. Uh, they're a little more tolerable. They're a little more tolerable, uh, and and I I was able to line things out, you okay. know, in in a way that I could maybe get by with it and things like that. I could I can actually connect in from over the internet and stuff like that. Into stuff. do they have internet there? Uh, they do. Uh, uh, not great, but they do have it. Okay. Yeah. So nothing really bad happened while I was gone. So it was a it was a good thing back that's, at work. That's so. always good. Yeah. And how'd your wife uh, respond to you coming home? My wife was great. She, you know, if God's telling me to do it, she <clears throat> she won't let me not do it. That's nice. You know what I mean? I, I can see a lot of a lot of wives maybe not being too thrilled being left with four kids at home. Yeah. For two weeks. Well, she got her opportunity because she went back to Uganda without me. Okay. And, uh, and so to actually find us, we, we thought our calling was to go back over and to be missionaries that help people find, uh, kids to adopt. Okay. And it ended up, God said, well, actually you're one of those people <laughs> okay. that I want to go over there to, to adopt, to have kids to adopt. And so um, you know, God, he's amazing. He, he, he has it all figured out. We don't always have it, him figured out. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, he knew what our, what the plan was, but he didn't let us in on all of it. Maybe because we couldn't handle it. Maybe we, Fair. we just didn't know if we could, if we knew everything, I don't know that cause we ended up selling our house. We sold our belongings. We moved to our family farm getting ready to go and uh oh so you were gonna permanently we were gonna go yeah we were semi-permanently yeah like two two to five years was kind of our thinking and taking your family with you taking everybody okay and uh and i mean it was it was a journey it really was and how long did you end up you went over there found that called the adopt two kids and did you guys come back or did you stay and do that we uh, we never <clears throat> moved over there. Uh, we we actually uh, ended up uh, buying a house next to my mom and dad because our house eventually sold. It took like a year, and uh, but we uh, we ended up going over there about a year later, and it took us that long to kind of figure out 
what God was calling us to do and to get it lined out. And then once once we knew, they, they say, wait, wait on God with your running shoes on. That's what happened. You know, once we, once we got the call, hey, they're ready to adopt. Mm-hmm. I mean, we had like two weeks to get there. And, uh, and then, you know, and we took all of our kids. We all went. This was our mission. And so we took all of our kids to Uganda. And uh, it, it was amazing. It really was. Our, our youngest was about four at the time, three or four. And, I mean, we're going all over Uganda. I mean, it's just... It sounds fun. It, it was fun. It was, as a dad, though, you know, as the protector, yeah. you're going into a, a scenario you don't know anything about normally. Sure. Um, so, you don't know the, the language as well. You know, you don't know the layout. So, you know, I'm, I'm like, you know, the techie guy. So, I, I'm trying to have Wi-Fi wherever we go and have GPS on my kids and, and so all that. I mean, you go over to Africa. I, I genuinely have no idea what Africa is like. So, I don't know. It's like, do they have hotels? Or are you just going to a village? Like, what is the... Man, you name it. You name it. You could have cardboard uh, slums. You could have... Uh, so, it kind of depends on where you go? Yeah. you could. Okay. We stayed at Hotel Africana at the end, and it's, it's really nice. Okay. Really nice place. Um, more Americanized, I guess. Kind of. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. A lot more than, you know, just out in the bush or something like sure. that. Um, but you get outside of the big city, um, you don't know. And anywhere you're at, you may have electricity one day, you may not have it the next day. Um, that's just, they, they have a saying, this is Africa. And yeah. that's, that's what it is. It's, it's Africa. Do you hire, I guess, people to drive you and whatnot? You do, yeah. Because I assume you don't know where the next gas station is, or <laughs> no. Uh, you could rent. You can actually rent a vehicle there, um, but I'd say not, unless you're you live there like a missionary, you're mm-hmm. you're going to be hiring the driver, and you don't really know them. You you might have some reviews, or you might hear people say this one's good, this one's yeah. not. But um, but yeah, you there there's weird stuff that goes on that happens, but. Overall, we felt really safe. That happens at the cruise terminal. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> it's ten times worse there. <laughs> um, that's interesting. Uh, and so, I guess adoption-wise, how much does that cost? I've always heard like around the ten thousand dollar mark, but I don't know oh, if that's man. old data or just high or that's back when. Because you also hear the horror stories of like people who like put tens of thousand dollars into adopt a kid, and then there's no kid. And they just yeah. got ripped off, and it was a, a whole scheme. And well, you do need to be careful. You need to do need to do your research. Mm-hmm. You know, know people that have adopted through a certain agency. Um, I would definitely use an agency that's you know that is American based when you're going to do an adoption that already has contacts, already has lawyers over there that they've already done the legwork and stuff like that. Um, it's, it would be very hard to bring a child back into the United States that's not fully vetted. Okay, okay. so yeah. the, Uni- the Uganda <laughs> government, yeah, the Uganda government does their whole side. But then the U.S. Embassy doesn't just take their paperwork and, and go with that. They, they do their due diligence as well. Okay. And then you're doing your due diligence. I mean, as I'm, you know, we're researching too. What can you do though? Well, you get online and you see, okay, is this, you know, um, who are we going through? What are they? Okay, for the agency, not necessarily the family you're adopting. Not necessarily okay. the family. So I'm like, I doubt their own Facebook. Yeah, yeah. They're not, well, they're surprisingly, but not our family. But, um, but yeah, you can you can kind of find out different things people have adopted through there before, or what are they saying? Okay. Uh, there's a stigmatism though sometimes that's not good. You know, hey, they're taking our kids, or you know, something like that. Um, and that's something that, you know, we don't, we didn't even... Uh, oh, so you're talking that the kids you're adopting from Africa are being kidnapped or somehow... Well, the, the local people, they might think... Okay. They might have a bad impression about uh, people coming in and adopting kids. Got it. They may hear horror stories or something like that. Sure. Um, that may or may not be true. I, uh, but uh, what, I, what I do know is that... Uh, we had an opportunity after we adopted our kids. We took the fan, the grandma and the uncle out to eat, 
and the lawyers and stuff like that. It's kind of a tradition. And the grandma wanted us to come back to her house, which was just a, a hut, basically, out way out in the bush. And I thought, you know what? I don't want it to look bad, like we're going to go there and exchange money or anything like that. I, but God just really nagged me to, you know, really both of us, my wife and I, you need to go. You need to see where they're from, where they actually lived and came from. We went out into the bush. It was We were already way out there. It was uh, Fort Portal in Uganda. And we went way out into the bush. And... Uh, hiked we got as far as we could drive and then we hiked the rest of the way and my daughter sarah she just took off running we didn't even couldn't even see her and I, i'm like <laughs> oh, i don't know what's going on right you know, there's you know banana trees and there's you know weird looking cows and everything i'm just i i'm kind of freaked out she knew right where she was going she was going to grandma's house and we walk up and she comes out with sugar cane that she's chewing on and a plastic cup of water. She's at grandma's house. And grandma took us out right, probably about 200 feet outside of the house underneath the banana trees and pointed down. And uh, the translator said, she's pointing to her daughter's grave. Hmm. She's pointing to Sarah and Faith's mom's grave. And uh, that meant so much to us. You know, it was, it was something that we could, you know, never forget. We were there. We could see where, she, where Sarah and Faith grew up uh, as long as the grandma could afford them, could afford to take care of them. But we also saw that we had physical evidence. They are orphans. Right. They right. they do need a home. And to have the grandma bring us into her her world and her intimate atmosphere, it was like such a privilege and an honor. And she brought us into her house. And in, in her house, I'm huge, so I, I had to duck down. Yeah. And, uh, and there was a rat running across one of the beams. And... Uh, and she started jumping up and down, praising God. And she grabbed our hands and, and prayed. And we couldn't understand what she was saying, but the translator was, was telling us. And she just started jumping up and down. And man, that, that lets you know that God answered her prayer at the exact same time he answered my prayer and my wife's prayer. Mm -hmm. And that he answered Sarah and Faith's prayer. And man, to have that happen was an honor and a huge responsibility all at the same time. I mean, it was just, uh, it was awesome. And I, and that's why I named that the book after her, because after her as grandma, because what an awesome lady, what an awesome woman of God yeah. that deserves to be remembered. So, um, I guess what kind of circumstances was that? Was this a village? Was this a, a city? Uh, where the grandma lived, I don't even know. It was way out in the bush. Like, I were mean, there other people around her? There was probably a hundred yards away was the neighbor. Okay. You know, and then probably a hundred yards the other way was another neighbor. You couldn't see him because it was like a, a banana Thick tree foliage, or plantain yeah. type uh, farm. And one of the neighbors came, and the grandma was so excited to show off. Mm -hmm. uh, not Sarah and Faith. And she wasn't excited to show off my wife and I. And she wasn't excited to show off my white kids uh, that are, have red hair. But she was excited to show off my oldest two that were adopted. Because what she's showing off is that, look, they have adopted kids that have grown up. That they've taken care of and they're well fed and they're healthy. Mm -hmm. This is what my daughters are getting. And I never knew what, what kind of impact that would bring to have my oldest kids that had been adopted to Uganda. I never, never would have thought that. But it meant the world to her because it gave her comfort and a peace. That's interesting. Um, so, like, what did Grandma do for a living? Like, how did she how do you make money out there? Was she connected, I, to, was she connected like, water and electric? Or is this, like, 
Super oh, no, no, no. This is like uh, this is like a hut, and the kitchen is another hut with a fire pit. Okay. Um, so very remote, very village. This I guess, is yeah. This would backwards. be this would be like uh, yeah. No water. No. I mean, to to get water, my daughter had to carry a jerry can and go go to the creek and get water. Okay. Now, Grandma, I think I think how she made a little bit of money. I think she helped out at a hospital which is basically a room with beds in it. Okay. And that was probably, I would say, three or four miles away. Okay. And I'm assuming you'd walk in there. I would guess so, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they had neighbors that would help out with milk that had a milk cow or whatever. And sure. Stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, I, I think one of the things that lacks in our world here in the Comforts is this perspective. Um, and you've gotten to see how other people are living which you know i mean grandma there is living what maybe 200 years from what we lived you know how america lived yeah or yeah even more i mean uh now they do they do have cell phones amazingly that work really well <laughs> out in the okay. sticks in the, and they've got uh they call them boda bodas but they're motorcycles that you can you know hire mm -hmm. get on the back i never i said i'd never ride one i never did I, I just not gonna not gonna be good for a big guy like that. Somebody bought him out those shocks. <laughs> yeah, uh, and their speed bumps are huge. They're like uh, probably six feet wide and two or three feet tall. I mean, they're just ginormous. It doesn't make any sense. Huh. Yeah, but uh, there's a lot of stuff over there that doesn't make sense to us. But they they do it and they do it well. You know. Okay. Interesting. Uh, Okay, so you adopt. So, uh, I guess cost of adoption, um, or in even the process, if you don't want to get into cost, uh, what was more challenging, adopting from here in the U.S. or adopting uh, from abroad? Um, I, I would probably steer clear of the cost just because it, it's going to fluctuate so much depending on where you're at, who okay. you go through, and what's the variables there. Um, well, pro a lot of it. Could be attorney's fees this side and that side. Okay. Um, travel costs. Um, you know, we took our whole family, so that's gonna sure. ratchet it up. Uh, you know, things like that. They've got court fees, visa fees. You know, get just going in and out of the countries costs money. Um, passports there, then you got to get passports here because of it. Then you got a whole court process over here to go through just to get them to be United States citizens. Mm -hmm. So it does add up. Um, I don't know, you know, how comparable, comparable it would be to just have hospitalization fees for a normal child labor or C-section. You know what I'm saying? Like with doctor's fees and stuff like that. Um, well, I can tell you, we paid cash for um, our kids, and it was about 5000 a piece. Really? So by the time you doctor, hospital, all that, anesthesiology, all that. And that yeah. was for C-sections. Um, and there's there's funds out there available for uh, to help people mm -hmm. that can't afford adoption. So, like, our church it has the Karis Adoption Fund, K-A-R-I-S. And they've got funds, and they've helped 150 kids get it adopted so far. Um just, just for families that, you know, hey, this is expensive. I can't, I, I'm being called to do it, but I don't have the funds. You know what? Let's help these people sure. that are being called that just don't have funds. And so that's what that, that fund is for. And if there's one fund like that, there's going to be more. Yeah. Um, so if God's calling you to do it, man, don't stop. I mean, it's a blessing. It really is. Uh, so what was the second part of your question? The, the process of it or... You oh, you compared the the stateside adoption versus uh, oh yeah versus uh, uh, domestic versus yeah abroad yeah because um, you've done both we've done <laughs> so. both uh, but it was almost like we did them both the hard way I don't know you know okay <laughs> it was like I don't know I think uh, nine months of pregnancy might be easier. Uh, it was for me, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but my wife might disagree with that. But uh, the adoption here for us was a challenge. And then uh, just overseas, I guess that, that's always going to be a little, you know, you're going overseas. You don't even know the language. So, yeah, that's going to be a challenge. So, um, How long is the process? Well, 
probably probably about six months would be my okay. guess. Yeah. And, and that's, kinda, is that from saying, hey, I want to adopt, or is that from identifying, hey, these two kids right here are the yeah. ones I want? I would I would say either way. It could be such a big variable because okay. Uganda law changes, you know, daily. It, it, there's not like this big process like um, maybe in China or something like that that you hear, okay, you're going to be here a week. Mm-hmm. And on the day you move to this spot and then on the day you go here and then you will be back home by this point. Uganda, you know, sometimes they're open. Sometimes, no, you need to live with the family for a long time in in country. I mean, it, it just changes. Hmm. So, um, you know, really doing research on uh, on that kind of thing would, would be my advice. And it's been a while since we've done it. So... Because I, yeah. I remember before I even had kids, I read it was a Dungy's book, Tony Dungy, because mm-hmm. uh, he adopted. I remember he was thinking about adoption because one of his like, like coaches had thought or had done it, recommended it. So I guess he went in, filled in some paperwork because they just want to explore the options. I guess the other coach had it took about I think it was six months, a year, whatever it was, like a good long time. He got a call the next day saying they had a kid ready. Yeah, it, which which I guess was um, you know Tony's. Tony's black, and so he was willing to adopt a black child. I think the other coach was white and was going to adopt a white kid. Um, and so I guess there's so many black kids in the system that they just saw him. And probably he's Tony Dungy, so you probably get expedited a little bit faster. You can, you know, <laughs> verify money is obviously not an issue. And well, uh, I would say, you know, I know he was shocked by the speed. Yeah, I would say, you know, the more open you are to uh, the child's age, the child's, you know, health. Um, the child's race. I mean, if you just say, "Hey, you know, we're open. We mm-hmm. want to adopt." You know, there's going to be a lot of opportunities, and the more specific you be, you get, um, you know, it's going to take longer. And you never did the uh, fostering, right? Or no, uh, we've kind of done like uh, respite and and stuff like that. Where I don't know what that means. Which, which means like you're a short-term foster. You, okay. You know, you help out a foster parent or something like that. You you. You're just helping. Okay. You're not necessarily a foster placement. Um, I told my wife, I said, I, I can adopt. I can like take a kid for the rest of their life, but to take a kid for two years and then maybe send them back to a bad environment. I said, I just, that would tear me up. I just couldn't do that. Yeah. And so uh, foster parents, man, they've got a, they've got a huge heart and they, I don't know how they do it. I really don't. So, so I have a friend that did it, and he was on one of our podcasts. Um, he's down in uh, Mississippi, and they fostered and adopted, um, and then they fostered. Uh, they had two other boys, and uh, were in the process of adopting when I guess something happened, and um, a family member intervened and, and I guess regained custody. And they were almost to the point where they were like they were planning, I guess, the celebration, you know, for the, for the yeah. adoption and. They had a whole overseas trip plan. They were going to go to Italy, and oh man, uh, yeah, it was a it was, you know, it, it was a big deal. It's heartbreaking because they'd had them for a long time, um, uh, and then you know, obviously, you hope that they went back to their real family and ended up being in a good situation. But I guess you just never know because you're not really allowed to find out. So yeah, it's in a lot of ways, it's a messed up system. Yeah, they try to do. They well, try to do well, right. Well, you hope that you know they went back to family and, and everything yeah. went good. They try to do right. They try to keep the family together, and and I I appreciate that part about at least Oklahoma DHS. But sometimes they go a little too far, um, where you know they they end up keeping the kids in the system longer because of that, and then maybe one of them becomes unadoptable, and then it's just like this. You know, why couldn't we have? done this moved quicker moved quicker five years ago so as kids get older they become more difficult to adopt is that what i just heard you say well i would you know i would definitely say that's probably the case Um, okay you know and then the older they get you know the more chances they have to you know make mistakes and i don't know you know have some sort of uh they need a family that loves them and cares for them. And the longer they go without that, the more behavioral problems they're going to get into. Um, I think that's the importance of, you know, of a family. I mean, that's, that's why we, we adopted. 
Um, so, and they, they just need it. They need families to step up and say, you know what, this is what we can do. Fair enough. Um, so that's kids, and how old are your, uh, the two girls, two girls, right? From a, yeah, Uganda? they're 12 and 11 right now. Okay. Um, and you were telling me earlier, you guys had a planned trip this year. Yeah. Well, everybody COVID had ruined. a planned trip this year, didn't they? Sure. <laughs> Was that going to be your 20th celebration? No. Going back to Africa? No, no. Is that no gonna celebration be going back there. <laughs> Uh, I love the I love Uganda. I love the people. Man, they're so hospitable and and loving there. Mm-hmm. Um, but it wouldn't definitely be a twenty year uh, anniversary trip. But <laughs> we did. We were planning to go back and have this, you know, amazing race type thing. I don't know what you'd call it, but we were going to try to find Mukaka mm-hmm. and uh, and any family that we possibly could. Sure. And. Uh, they're at an age where they could remember that and they'd really appreciate that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, Makaka was getting old, so we wanted to do it as soon as we, you know, as we could. But, uh, do you have any way of knowing, uh, or contacting or communicating with her? No, we've, we've tried going, yeah. you know, contacting the orphanage that they stayed at. Um, but, uh, haven't heard anything back. Cause I guess if you're in the middle of the woods in a shack, there's no mail service. Yeah, it's very uh, hard to get anything over there. You know, right. yeah, mail is is not their their strong suit. Um, hmm. Okay. Email is okay, but the guy that was our contact. Well, if you have no power in electric, then yeah, you- <laughs> some tells me she doesn't have an email address. Well, that would have been fun. Uh, you guys still gonna plan on I guess doing it for twenty twenty one or. Have they eased up international travel, or is that still shut down? I don't know. I mean, everything's like crazy right now, so yeah. I, I don't even know. I think this is going to be a, a time to remember, but um, I hope they do. I, that would be awesome if we still could. That's still, you know, we're, we're planning on it. Okay. As much as you can plan anymore. Right. You know, we we could plan on going around in, in the country in a, in a camper, but there's only crazy people that do that right yeah. now. There's a lot more than I thought, to be honest. <laughs> I thought we were going to be going to these places to be completely alone, really isolated, and we're getting into campgrounds that are just sold out. Really? Yeah. 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 And a lot of people, one of the best things to come out of COVID is the, um, the family's unit is kind of coming back together because life slowed down. Uh, There's nothing else to do. Kids were at home. They weren't in school. Parents weren't at work. Um, so I remember when it first started, uh, like, we had a friend that owned a bike shop and he could not keep bikes in stock. I, yeah, we couldn't find a bike either. Because everyone was buying bikes. Yeah. Everyone was getting their bikes fixed. I mean, his business was booming. Um, and RV sales right now are the same way. RV dealerships just can't keep. If you have an RV and you're not using it, you can sell it to a dealership for good money. Because they just, they need inventory. Because they're yeah. just, they're, they're running out. Um, because everyone's going camping. Everyone's got time to spend with their family. Everyone's going on bike rides. Everyone's going on hikes. Everyone's going to the nearby park. So it's, I think it's one of the uh, one of the good things to come out of COVID is families are spending a lot more time together. They're getting outside together. Um, yeah. And it, and it kind of slowed everyone down from the, um, the craziness that can consume lives. Yeah. So then we don't, you know, we, we, we never fell into it too hard. I know like with baseball practices and things like that, um, you know, some of those after school activities, which, you know, we've been doing homeschool for a while. Um, so it wasn't quite after school. Um, but even with that, that was still, it was running our afternoons like crazy and yeah. you know, getting the practices and games. And you think it'd be simple because it's like two practices a week in a game, but then schedules are always bouncing and fields oh, wet. And it just, it created such chaos. And if you got multiple it, kids playing, you know, we homeschool too. <clears throat> and, uh, I didn't know that. Yeah. And so we, uh, and I coached the basketball team, but thankfully they have all practices early in the morning. So oh, that's nice. It's a big, you know, a big, huge complex that has multiple courts. So uh, that makes it more doable. But if you got practices spread out for multiple kids and each one of them has a game a week, I mean, it you just, run around like crazy. It's already crazy right now. So mm-hmm. that, that makes it even worse. Yeah. And so, uh, so we would like, we would play spring baseball. We would not play fall ball. Was it fall or whatever it was, summer? Um, you know, baseball always has two seasons. And my oldest loves baseball, but we wouldn't play the other season. Yeah. We played the one. It's just, 
It's it's like, it wasn't worth it as a family. Like we wanted some more time because we really bond, and I think most fam- a lot of families bond uh, over the dinner table. Yeah. Like, that's just where we talk most and kind of connect the deepest because you know there's no TVs and we're all just sitting there and you either stare at each other and chew and listen to the sounds or yeah, you, know, you just talk. Uh, that's that's what we do too. We you know actually lunch and dinner most days because uh, I work from home a lot of times. But uh, you know on Sundays. Uh, uh, we normally do a, what we call family forum and uh, everybody it, I always say okay it's time for family forum it's a place where you can come and say whatever you want uh, as long as you're respectful and you won't get in trouble and so it's like this open time where sometimes you have kids that are maybe a little more reserved mm-hmm. and uh, maybe they're afraid hey I might if I say something I'm gonna get in trouble or somebody's gonna well it, it's just they they like it and yeah that's always you know you always have something like I want to buy this or I want to get that can I do this or or something like that or I don't like it when someone so you know plays you know the Xbox more than I do or whatever but um, most you know a lot of times you get some good conversation and uh, and so and that happens around the table right and um, and so they know once a week you know, they've got a time, you know, they can bring it up anytime really, but they know uh, once a week um, we're going to pause and we're going to say, Hey, how, how's it going? And what do you have for the family and, and things like that? What, what good has come out of that so far besides the, you know, openness and communication and all that? Yeah. Anything, anything specific come to mind? Um, I'd say, my kids seem happy. That's good. You know, they don't, I don't, and I can't say I relate it directly to family form, but, um, you well, know, it helps, I, it helps if there's nothing pent up and you're, you're able yeah. to, and that's the, uh, that's what I mean. It's not like they're always happy. I mean, sure. that, but, but like you said, that you can, you can understand them better. You know, you know what, you know, when something means a lot and they're bringing it up mm-hmm. and they feel comfortable to do that. Um, so, so, so I, I grew up, uh, I remember my dad always said, uh, especially usually when we got caught, it's better to tell me the truth ahead of time than try and lie to me. And I was always, I was always like, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I don't know whose house you're living in. That is not true. <laughs> we are better off lying. Punishment's going to be about the same. <laughs> oh man. Uh, yeah, I could, uh. I try, I mentally, you know, I, I really do, if they bring it to me, I, tr- I do try to make that happen. Where, yeah. Where they're not, you know, in some ways you got to kind of do that because. Because you kind of have to, and we have to, I guess, punish the bad behavior. You have to kind of uh, incentivize the fact that it is something good too. Yeah. Otherwise, you don't want to punish that and push, you know, make that behavior not happen again. You want that and to be a repetitive thing. It's this whole thing of like, uh, you know, it's this test, you know, you're trying to figure out, okay, this works for this kid, but it totally did the opposite for this other kid. And so I've got, you know, some that may lie. And so like, come down really hard. We're not having lying in this house. Oh, huh, uh, we're going to, you know, come down really hard on you. So you'll learn your lesson and never lie again. Well, now they're scared to death lying all the time because they don't want to get into that kind of trouble anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, you know, I've had to, we both had to kind of try to learn, you know, the, the hard way and, uh, what works for each kid. Some things don't work at all. We, you know, we can spank one kid or even threaten, even look like I'm about to spank on it and they cry and they, and, you know, they'll never do that thing again. Mm-hmm. The other one, you know, <clears throat> you could spank them till the sun went up and down and up and down and they, they'd still do it. You know, yep. what's going to work for one kid doesn't always work for the other. Kid. Yeah, I think I think a one dimensional dad is in, uh, is going to be a problem. Yeah. Where it's, you know, the 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 complete my way or the highway. Now, there are some things that I, I'm definitely like that my way or the highway. But um, yeah, all three of my kids, my first kid, I thought I was the greatest dad ever. I mean, I, I genuinely did because he's a little OCD, wants to impress everybody. So like wants to learn, wants to show off, wants to like be the best at everything. Um, and, you know, definitely listens to rules, loves rules, loves structure. 
So yeah. let's just thought I was awesome. Second kid, not a care in the world for rules. <laughs> not a care in the world to show off. Doesn't really want to, like he's smart. He learns things, but he'll tell you the wrong answer on purpose because he just, just doesn't mess with you. Just doesn't care. Just, <laughs> like Levi wants you to know he knows everything. And Ryder's like, eh. Yeah. It just is uh, not motivated by that. Yeah. Um, and so it's been, it's been a, uh, like you said, you just have to take different approaches, different kids. And my third one's a wild one. I'm just absolutely crazy. Uh, doesn't really think about consequences. Uh, he's only four, so you know he doesn't get a ton of discipline. Just you know guidance and adjustments. But we're, we're getting to the age to where I think he's gotten spanked once or twice now. Um, but I don't like. I've never been a big fan of spanking unless you can like really the kid can understand why you're spanking. Yeah. Um, so my thing is, I've only done it a few times, and I'm I'm definitely like a. Uh, I'm okay with spanking. I know there's a lot of parents out there that I put a meme out there once, and I just got a ton of hate from it. Um, usually from moms. And uh, I've just always been like, spanking shouldn't be beatings. Yeah. Like, you're not trying to injure the person. Like, you're not, like, getting revenge. Like, you're just, hey, this is behavior correction. You got spanked because you did this. Yeah. I want to spank you. I just want to make sure you don't do this again. Yeah. Um, and, like, you know, if spanking didn't work, wouldn't do it. Well, there's no point. Yeah. I mean, it, you, you actually don't want to do it. And so, if it's not working, it's almost like, well... You gotta do something kind of different. Almost I mean. a relief, you know. I think you know, with spanking, if I was gonna give any kind of advice on it, you know, set your own rules uh, for yourself. I mean, okay, you're gonna spank up to this age. After that, you know, we're not gonna spank after this certain age. You know, um, the amount of spanking. You know, what constitutes. Uh, you know the the offense. What offense would constitute spanking? Sure. Um, you know things like that that you and your wife agree on, and uh, and I, and I, the the main point would be what do you agree on? You know, and so the punishment needs to be uh, something that both husband and wife agree on because both husband and wife have to back each other up. Mm -hmm. And right. if you don't, those kids I, well, I would smell say that. that. I would say that's for almost everything. Oh yeah, those kids smell it. They're gonna <laughs> even, even the best kids can smell a little division, and they know who to go play they against. Capitalize what, yeah, on it. They're gonna capitalize oh, on absolutely. it. Absolutely. So uh, no matter what the punishment, you know, make it fit the crime, and then you know have have some boundaries on on it. One thing that we we learned was mm -hmm. we realized what we were doing. We were double punishing, or we would triple punish. Like, uh, give them a SWAT and then send them to their room. All right, you know, you know, something like that. Well, you, okay. And so they're actually getting punished twice for the for one thing. You know, it's almost like hmm. double taxation or something like that. You you know, and then we'd also realized uh, the punishment that we're punishing our kids with is actually punishing us. And so, uh, like these week long groundings that we had to remember. You know. Mm -hmm. It was just miserable, you know, for us. You we're, know. we're in that stage right now. Yeah. Towards, I'm, not, I'm actually starting to get a little concerned. I'm not sure how to punish my kid, though. Well, my oldest one. So because find a punishment that benefits you is kind of <laughs> my so, thought. So now he's cleaned the bathroom every day. Yeah, there right you now. go. Because he carved his name into my truck. <laughs> <laughs> the outside paint. Yeah, like, well, and why not? I mean, it's he, a truck. And he's going to clean that bathroom every single day <laughs> until he um, finally cops up to it. Because yeah. no one else carved his name in there, and it's his handwriting, and he uh, still hasn't owned up to it yet. Well, he probably like, won't, you know, I mean, kids. until he's way older. I mean, <laughs> you know, kids. He, and, yeah. and, and to expect a kid to not be a kid, you know, is like... Uh, no. So that's something I was giving thought to the other day was... Um, um, a way, all right, so going back to punishments, because we're living a life now on the road. So we're already super, con there's like not many things we can take away because we're yeah. just, we're living very minimalistic now. We're in an RV. We can only have so many things. Um, and then like I said, if, if we're going to ground them, we're still going to a new city almost every week or every other week, Yeah. Uh, which we're going to go explore. We can't just leave a kid at the RV. Like and grandma and grandpa aren't there to watch them. Um, or I'm not going to trust a babysitter in every city just not knowing who they are. So they're still going to go to the, the science museum today. They're still yeah. going to... Um, and then when we're out, we're going to go out and eat because, you know, we don't always get back to the RV in time. Um, so, yeah, it, it is becoming 
we just don't have we don't have a lot of luxuries to take away. Yeah, one and, thing and, and time punishments are they're, they're just as much of a punishment on us as, yeah, as they are on anything you. else. Exactly. So one, one thing we would do on the road because my wife's from South Dakota, so we that's like a twelve hour trip, and uh, we'd make them sit on their hands, you know, or uh, they'd have to close their eyes or you know put a sheet over their head or something like that. Nothing suffocating them or anything. Oh, yeah. like that. But like a blanket or something. Put a like plastic that. bag over your head. <laughs> That'll teach you. <laughs> and then the, my dad would always make us run. We, I hated running, and so oh, yeah, yeah, I had to do that too. We had a it, steep driveway too. He would make us. We had like this park area. And it was like a mile around it. So go jog a mile. You know, when we got old enough, it gets us out of the house. Mm-hmm. We're not fighting anymore in front of them, and we hated it. And so we'd have to go jog a mile. Well, I mean, depending on the age of the kid, you know, the distance can, sure, sure. can vary, but it gets their energy out, you know, stuff like that. Uh, punishments is, we used to have like a jar that had sticks in it because some of the, one of the hardest things about punishing a kid is trying to think of the punishment that, to make them have, you know, it's like, oh, man, I gotta, no, I did that one yesterday. You know? <laughs> yeah. you know, so they got to go get a, a stick out of the jar that had a punishment on it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it was like Russian roulette for them, but it worked for pretty good for a while, you know, until we didn't do it anymore. Yeah, I think I'm just, it's going to be more clean and chores, whatever we can do to help mom. You're going to do yeah. the dishes, you're going <laughs> to you know, clean the bathroom, you're going to clean the other bathroom. Um, <laughs> and at first, I mean, the RV is pretty small, so there's only so many things to clean. So. Yeah, clean somebody else's RV. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, I guess we can always wash the outside of it. Yeah. Uh, Oh man, I I don't envy you on the road like that because they, they know they got you over barrel sometimes on the road. Yeah, a little bit. Um, I'm also we we're living much more. Um, this is a phase of our life where we're kind of much more relaxed and free. Um, so they are allowed to get away with a little bit more now than they used to. Because I used to be very, um, I say military t- style, but that gets some bad connotations. Like we woke up at the same time, we went to bed at the same time, we pretty much yeah. ate at the same times. Um, you know, we had fun. They homeschooled. They got to do stuff. They were always at the beach or, you know, walking a hiking trail or going to a playground or meeting up with friends. We would trampoline in the backyard that the whole neighborhood descended on. Um, so we had a lot of fun. It wasn't like military horrible. It was just we were very structured. Yeah. And now we're not. <laughs> now we never know when we're going to eat. Um, we almost never know when we're waking up or going to sleep because we're out doing stuff. Um, our time zones are changing all the time. Uh, so I've tried to become more relaxed and less um, uh, like rule bound. Mm-hmm. Like so, they get away with a little bit more. We've been giving them a little more freedom and things like that. Um, every once in a while, I have to dial it back in because especially the oldest will take advantage of that. Um, yeah. But it's been uh, so. I've been trying to not like even our our, our meals are. Uh, we have a small table in the dining room. We can't fit, all fit there. So it's like someone has to sit on the couch or yeah. sit on a different chair. So we, we really don't get to eat as much anymore. So it's a different life. But at the same time, we're together all the time. Yeah. Like there is not a moment in a day where not, you know, the five of us are not together. Um, except, of course, today where they left me at the RV <laughs> and then never came back. Um, so uh, they knew you needed some alone time, I guess. Well, I got, I came here and got a bunch of work done and I'm like, man, I'm so good. I'm so glad I got that done. Um, at the same time, I left here with a whole nother list of things I need to do because I finally got some clarity and like figured out what I had to do. Um, and that's going to be never ending. Um, trying to work on the road with the life we're living. Uh, cause it's not like we go and we're just like at the RV all day. Mm-hmm. We're out doing stuff all the time. Um, you know, exploring and seeing what's out there. So I never really get a chance to. Uh, kind of like zone in and get focused and it takes me um i'm just not one of those guys that gets right into it like it takes me like 20 30 minutes to like kind of like regain my bearings and figure out where i'm at and and you know start to get actual work done yeah i'm kind of the um, same way i gotta have a list you know yeah, just list, start making a list. list certainly help uh but just getting in that mindset where i can be actually productive um just takes me some time um and i've always been that way um uh, and so it's hard to when everything's get scattered, some like if I try and work in the RV with kids, like by the, I'll get like ten minutes into it, kind of start to get there, and then like someone's calling me, I got to go fix something, or and I'm always getting pulled out of that mode. Um, so it's been really tough to get work done. I just went off on like nine different tangents. I can't remember what the original intent was. <laughs> I don't either. Yeah, I mean, 
<laughs> something about the way we're living or uh, but so I'm trying to dial back on rules now to where we don't have as many rules because uh, what I noticed was starting to happen and what I didn't want to life to be like is where like I'm always crushing the kids like they're always getting in trouble we have so many rules that they're always getting hammered on something yeah um, which is just no fun to live that way as a parent it's yeah. no fun to live that way as a kid where like you just can't do anything right you're just getting yelled at all day every day because there's just too much to worry about and they're kids like you got to give them some freedom to be a kid um, and, and in our situation um, we stuck three kids in a tin box and then we traveled <laughs> like all the time and are doing stuff all the time and there's that stability they've known their whole life is, is essentially gone yeah and now it's um, more chaos and wild um, tons of fun the learning experiences are off the charts the experience um, uh, their perspective of the world is off the charts um, uh, but it's different so I, I've, I've, I've really tried to ease up on rules um, but yeah like you know writing your name into the outside of a very <laughs> nice truck come on dad I thought you were <laughs> easing up on rules here <laughs> yeah that one uh, that one I'm not thrilled about um, <laughs> but that one I'm just mad because that truck's my baby I mean I've just you know we we our whole lives we've had we've always bought older um, not crappy, like they drove really well. They're mechanically sound, but all of our vehicles were like 200,000 mile vehicles. You know, the, the expedition I just got rid of, I had like 280,000 miles before I bought this truck. Um, and, you know, it was a 2008. So I didn't mind that the kids beat it up. Yeah. Like if food spilled in there, I really didn't care. Uh, we always had the rubber mats. Um, you know, sand was everywhere because we we're a beach family. We were always driving on the beach. Dirty boots, didn't care. You know, if a kid wrote on, you know, the marker of the seat, you know, don't do that. But it didn't really matter because yeah. um, we're going to beat the crap out of this car anyway. And so now I have a super nice truck. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, it's kind of my thing. Um, so, you know, like he didn't harm anybody. It's uh, probably not, a, you know, uh, a sign of bad character. He probably just did something stupid. Probably while it was like uh, uh, we drove through that snowstorm. So... All that sand and salt and everything, you know, you just yeah. get that layer of crap. Probably just wrote on that and then you realize that it was scratching the paint. Yeah. But it's probably, you know, how some people would say, you know, that's in 10 years when you look back, you're going to think, wow, there's a, you know, his name or whatever you wrote on there that was going to be a good memory and all that kind of stuff. You know, I disagree with that. I think in <laughs> 10 years, you're still going to be kind of ticked off. You know, my son, he, he was, I don't know, probably seven years ago, I had a, this new uh, Honda Pilot, and, uh, you know, we don't get new cars very often. That one was new. He took his little, I don't know what it was. It was like a skateboard, but you wiggle on it. I don't even know what, the kids were riding him a lot. Oh, they then. kind of like the rollerblade wheels. That they, yeah, yeah. I know yeah. what you're talking about, yeah. And uh, he slipped, and he hit his head on that thing, you know, and... and, and Hondas, I don't know if all Hondas are like this, but if you sneeze, it dents, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and so the, the the head mark is still there. You know, I ran out there and I was like, you know, I want to say, I was like, are you okay? You know, to the, my son, but I was really more like, what happened to my <laughs> truck? You know, and so I still look at that and I'm like, dang it, you know, and, uh, you know, so. You can pop those out, can't you? I tried, but it was right on the, you know how like the, it'll curve and it kind of have a mm -hmm. sharp curve to it, the fender. It was kind of right by that, so that curve kind of keeps the the dent in. I'm not a body person, and and I just haven't had it paid to be popped back out. But yeah, uh, I did Google it. And I did watch videos on how to do it. <laughs> Took the hair dryer out there and all that, but didn't work. No, well, no, oh well. Yeah, I, I'll get over him right on the uh, scratch on the truck because it's not too deep. But you just need to have everybody do it, and it'll be kind of fun. Everybody's name no. will be on there. <laughs> <laughs> that is will not happen <laughs> so i'm trying i know this truck is gonna um i've just never had a really nice vehicle before like i always bought you so i've never had something to care about because I, because i had kids and this is what happens when you have kids like your 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 vehicle's gonna get torn up no matter what um, um yeah so i've got to learn to let it go because it's gonna get scratched it's gonna get dented it's gonna get chipped i mean we're on the road all the time yeah screws and rocks are gonna pop up and start chipping paint eventually um someone's probably gonna bump into it at a parking lot one day although i still park all the way in the back take up two spots and we walk seven <laughs> miles to get wherever we want to go to the front door uh, it is a nice truck 
Yeah. I also park back there because we're wide. Like, if I were to take a normal parking spot, like... <clears throat> Couldn't get out anyway. I mean, we're going to bang other people's cars. Like, especially I have kids and, like, the wind here in Oklahoma. Sometimes they crack the door open and it goes... <laughs> just flies oh, open. Oh, man, yeah. I'm like, wow. So... I usually default all the way to the back. <laughs> just, yeah, I don't blame you. Yeah. I do that too when I'm driving a truck. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's easier that way. And then I know I can get out. I won't get in weird spots where two cars are tight on me. And then, um, I don't know if you've ever been to any Lowe's. Lowe's is like the worst parking on the planet. Yeah. Like the way they structure their, uh, their parking lot, it's like they think everybody that goes and shops at Lowe's has like a Prius. Because <laughs> every spot is narrow. And then the width of their... Uh, their aisles where you drive and park are super narrow. So it's yeah. like getting out, you have like 30 point turn to get a decent sized truck out of there. Yeah, I, I actually, it was Lowe's that made me put double park. I started double parking at Lowe's and Home Depot, but and the truck, I, you don't I have I a bumped choice. into a guy. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I waited till he got back out there and he was real cool about it, but I was like, man, I'm not doing this again. <laughs> so Lowe's, you don't even have a choice. I mean, it's so narrow. I would have wheels hanging over both sides of the paint anyway. It's, <laughs> it's ridiculous. Um, trying to think. I forgot what we were talking about. Oh, but I, so I, I've been trying to have less rules to be broken and to kind of care a little bit less, let go a little bit more and let them, because uh, uh, that's one of the things I appreciate when I was a kid, that was having some freedoms to go out and do stuff. And, yeah. uh, you know, I think every generation that grows up is getting less and less freedom because parents are... Uh, getting more and more scared to let their kids out of their sight and go do stuff and and rightfully so i mean uh you know it, it's kind of scary even you know letting your kid go down the block sometimes so um yeah but scary but how many times has your kid been kidnapped well no i, I can't count that <laughs> yeah. uh, uh true um but i guess uh with with our older two you know we were really really strict and you know they go off to college and you're like they're like man freedom i got all this freedom and you're like please no you know and and you kind of see the other side of it and so it does help me to lighten up some uh, not on the other side of true teenagerisms yet so i don't really know like you know how old are your oldest 19 and 20. Um, so they're currently in college yeah uh, are they just staying at home and going to college, or are they? No, they they live on their own. Okay. They, they kind of they have roommates and stuff like that. So, what was the? I guess the the was a father daughter father son talk before they went off to college. Oh man, how many of those have we had? I don't. I can't keep count. <laughs> were, were there like critical things you were saying, like don't go out and drink every night, uh, don't get hit. Everyone else see me getting hammered. Try not to get hammered or, you know, only get hammered twice a week. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they kind of know where I come from and, and uh, what, what we expect from them. Just kind of been ingrained through the years. It has been and, and then yelled at them, you know, yeah. while, when they're in their teenage years and then uh, pleaded with them when they're, they leave. And, but they're, you know, I guess one of the hardest things to learn as a parent is, uh, that your kids make their own decisions and, it, and in the end it reflects their character, mm -hmm. not yours. And, and so <clears throat> that to me as a dad was very hard to learn because, you know, I'm a coach, I'm a dad, I, you know, I'm a Christian guy. And so to, to have, you know, a son or daughter, you know, that feels like they're disrespecting me by going against what I've taught them, mm -hmm. um, then, then you take that burden upon yourself. And it's not a burden that you can bear. It's only a burden that God can bear. And so when you actually leave that burden at the cross, um, then you, then you realize that the cross is the only thing that can save you and, and your kids. So you start praying more and that that's where the power is really at. That's where the change really comes from. And you actually, you know, the, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. And when you put that burden at, when you put the burden at the cross, you, you might even realize, you know what, when I was their age, I also had to put some burdens down here at the cross and some sin down here at the cross. And so you start looking at it maybe with a little bit more of a, a mercy 
mm-hmm. uh, and grace and not enough. You know, I, I don't have enough of that. You know, I'm still learning that with my kids. And uh, but I tell you what, teenage years are, are the hardest for me. I got a four-year-old. 10 year old, you know, I'm a, I help out with youth for, for a long time. I, you know, help out in the middle school, middle school, middle schoolers are weird. They're just crazy and weird, but I can understand that, you know, the 18, 19 year olds, uh, it's tough. You know, that's, that's a tough age because they're making their own decisions. You don't know if they're making them because of, because of you or despite you or because they just <laughs> well, want to do what they want to do, you know? So, uh, so yeah, that, that it, it's a different, different age group. Well, so as a parent, I mean, you got to lay those foundations down before those teenage years. Yeah. I mean, because if, well, you're, if, if you're waiting, I mean, cause you know, your core values as a family, like you were kind of saying, well, we um, did, we did yeah. lay them down. Um, but it's still not going to make it. Con- oh, go ahead. But if you don't, if you don't have those discussions, if you don't talk and then try and do that in those teenage years, I can see that being a massive problem and yeah. not being received well. And it, what is received well when you're a teenager? Nothing. Okay. Yeah. So that's it, why the the kind of character and integrity aspects are. Uh, I just feel it's important to have those being talked about and being demonstrated absolutely. in those younger years because it builds that foundation. And they listen to you back at that age, or they, at least they. You know, they want to, they, you know, respect you. They, they hear you more. I think by the time they're teenage, they hear a lot of stuff. From I don't a even lot care of if they listen. It's just, this is what you know, because this is your family. Yeah. Our family doesn't do this. Yeah. So that was my kind of theory. I don't, you know, we're not a family that does drugs. We're not a family. Like there is no expectation that anybody in our family is going to go to jail. Yeah. This, this is not going to happen. <laughs> we, we don't live that kind of life. Um, you know, we don't go to strip clubs. So, um, you know, we're not heavy drinkers, uh, or whatever it is. They've, they've never seen dad, um, uh, you know, have an affair or anything like that. I mean, it's just, you know, living by example and, uh, and then always kind of just talking about, I guess, what, uh, you know, what the morals and the values of the family are, which, uh, you know, obviously you're clearly a man of God and, and are active in the church. Um, and I think the church certainly helps lay down some of those values. Um, although I went to a church once, uh, it wasn't my church. Um, it was my parents' church and they were like, they were having a youth group graduation and like half the kids, it was really interesting. Um, weren't sure about their faith. Hmm. Like, and they were kind of like just said that in their testimony. They, they, they'd grown up in the church and, they just weren't 100% sure if it was right. You know, they enjoyed, like, the camaraderie of everybody. And um, I just couldn't help think, man, this church has done, or this youth group has done a pretty crappy job of, I don't know if they're just not talking about it or what, but I feel like those are things we address before you're 18 and, and getting out of there. It was, it was such a high percentage. Yeah. Well, of hopefully. The, of the kids hopefully that the, just didn't know if they believed in God. I mean, you almost got to appreciate those kids for being so honest. Oh, yeah. And I think everyone there did. And maybe it was an eye-opening experience. I think, you know, what you were saying earlier about, um, you know, this isn't, my kids know that this isn't acceptable in our house. Whatever that is, Mm -hmm. that is not acceptable in your house, your kids know it. But at some point, those, your kids are going to have to make that their decision. Yes, and uh, and sometimes they won't. And there's going to oh, there's going to be a clash. And I, I would expect almost every kid's going to rebel a little bit, yeah, and purposely go against the direction of the family. Yeah, and um, it's it's the same way with their faith. Mm-hmm. It's the exact same way with their faith. They've been taught about you know Christ their their whole life, but at some point in their life, and they're either going to rebel or they're going to accept it. But it's got to be on their own, mm-hmm. and. Uh, and that's what that's all we can do as parents is to lead them in the right direction pray for them that they they make those right decisions and uh and and that's what what's been hard for me because i want to make them for them you know i want to make those decisions for them but uh, (laughs) thankfully god doesn't allow that that's not that's not our job because that would be too big of a burden for 
of any dad or any parent to to have. Well, I'm big on um, raising them to be adults. Like we're not raising kids; we're raising, you know, fully functional, independent, capable, uh, productive members of society. Um, but adults, so uh, to that extent, I want them making those types of decisions on their own, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, and, and uh, kind of trying to train them and l- allowing them to make decisions as they get older and older, so that they can, uh, you know. I guess make some mistakes and make some bad decisions while dad's still around and uh, I guess just learn the the fundamentals to good decision making. Yeah. I guess for me, like, uh, what I struggle with is when they make a a decision they know is against me or against (laughs) what I would do Mm -hmm. and they just hey dad, this is what I'm doing. I don't really care what you think Mm -hmm. and this is who I am now and, and what I'm doing and how bad that hurts and then how I internalize that to, you know, every dad wants, wants respect and how I translate that hurt into disrespect and then, and then trying to still have a relationship with uh, my kids. You know, that's where I, I read in the Bible where you know, this dad had two sons and one of them came up to his dad and said, Hey dad, I want, I don't really care about you. Um, I don't really care if you're alive or dead, but I I want my inheritance right now. Proud of his son. Yeah. And so he takes his, his dad's like, surprisingly, his dad's like, here, here you go. Here's your, here's the inheritance. That's actually my money, but you can have it. Uh, and the son goes off and he parties and he, blows all that money and and everything else while the other son stays behind and works diligently and works hard the faithful son the faithful son but in his mind and in his heart you know is he he's despising the other kid probably because the other kid is getting away with stuff that he knows he can't get away with but maybe deep inside he might even want to but he's not going to do it he's going to stay behind and be the good good kid that that stays and helps his dad and then the other, the first son, the rebellious son, decides, you know what? After all of his money's gone, he, he doesn't even, he just wants to eat what he's feeding the pigs because that's the only job he can get. And he's saying, thinking, you know, the hired servants my dad has get fed better than this. I'll just go back to him and I'll, I'll kind of give an excuse. And the dad sees him a long way off and, uh, and he runs to him. And he tells the, the servants to bring him the, the best robe and, and to kill a calf and to have this party for him. And the, the other son is out in the field. And that, that's kind of who I am. I'm the guy that is out in the field doing the work. And, uh, and he's out there. He's like, what's that sound? The servants are like, well, there's a party because your brother's come back. And he's mad. He's, and the dad goes out to him even. And he says, you know what? Uh, everything I have is yours. But your son was lost and is now found. And uh, and the son that was out in the field, you know, he's just he's bitter and he can't get past that. You know, he never even had a young goat or lamb slaughtered for him, for and his friends. And in my mind, I, that's kind of me. Even with my kids, I'm like, man, they. I know God loves them, and I. I want that grace for them. I want that mercy for them. But you know what? They they disrespected me. They disrespected my family. They they've done this against me. And then I you know, as I say it and as I think it, man, am I so selfish? Am I that selfish? It's not against me. It's against God. And look what God did with that. God turned around and ran to them. God accepted them back and got, and that's what I'm waiting on is to, is to see that kind of repentance. And I want to be like God. I want to be where I drop my pride in the field where it belongs Mm -hmm. with the manure. And I run to my kid, you know, and I welcome him, welcome him back in the family because I don't want the bitterness and pride in my life to ruin that relationship and 
uh, I've got that struggle in my life. I think most men do. And I want, I want my son, I hope maybe someday, you know, he listens to this. And he knows I love him. Have you had that conversation with him? Ah, man, you know, we've, I've had so many conversations. Um, somewhat, but it, it was probably at a point in his life he couldn't hear it. Yeah. You know, there there is a point in that story. That's why reading the Bible is so important, because it gives us such a good perspective. But there's a point in that story where the son realizes how hungry he is and how miserable he is, how alone he is. Mm -hmm. And God did not run to them before that point. God ran to him as he was coming home. Mm -hmm. And uh, before that point, if he had a change in his pocket, <clears throat> he wasn't going to listen. He wasn't about to come home. And I think that's there's some people... You know, even me included at times, we've got to get to a certain point in our life and our kids have to get to a certain point in their life uh, that they realize they're nothing without God. And I'm nothing without God. And until we can get to that humble, uh, prideless point, you know, we're, we're on our own. But once we realize that, man, God is right there beside us to help us the rest of the way. Pride is usually the downfall of most man. guys. Yeah. <laughs> that's, uh, that's a tough one. That's for sure. Have you had that, um, um, I guess, that talk anytime with your son to where it's, uh, you know, no matter what, I'll always love you. No, no matter how bad it gets or how... how, how stupid you get or whatever it is um, I always love you I just don't like what the hell you're doing <laughs> yeah I, I have uh, and then he does some really stupid stuff and then I get even more mad yeah uh, and you know I had to he had to leave the house at 17 um, and uh, it was very hard very difficult um, and it's one of those things that, you know, you see him getting older and hopefully he's maturing through that as he's getting older. Mm -hmm. um, but you love him. Um, but sometimes you, the only way to not condone what they're doing is to take a step back. And the only way to, as a dad, sometimes to, you know, just help your marriage, help the other relationships is just take a step back. And it's one of the hardest things to do. You know, people look at me and they're like, man, you've adopted these kids. What a, you're such a great guy and such a great blessing. Man, I'm human. There's still truth to that. <laughs> I'm human. And, uh, and I'm embarrassed, you know, some of, some of the time, you know, hundred percent dad, you know, some days I'm 50% dead. Some days my kids might even argue I'm even that. And so, but I know a guy who's a million percent dead, and that's God the Father. And if I can point my kids to him, uh, I've done my job. And that's what I pray every single day, that they, they see him through me. And not me, because if they, if they just want to be like me, it's over. But if they're like the person that died for me, I mean, they've got an awesome life to live. I like it. Um, how old are your other kids? I got them from uh, 20, 19, 15, 12, 12, 11, and 4. 12, 12, are they twins? No, one's adopted from Uganda. So one's white okay. and one's black. So we don't ever get, are they twins? Yeah. <laughs> no. It'd be a funny way to introduce them. Uh, 12, 12, where's the other one? Four? 11 and oh, 4. 11 and 4. Yeah. Okay. Man, you got a long time ago. How old are you now? Oh, man, I mean, you know, 40? 40, 42 yeah, 40, or 3. Yeah. I can't even keep counting anymore. So you still got 14 years on top of that. 
Yeah, why are you bringing this up? I don't, I don't really get it. No, no. Because <laughs> I mean, you're making me feel like I got a long way to go. You do. You do. Well, the four year, it's, and it's a long path. It goes fast. I mean, you've probably already seen that already. Yeah, my my four year old though. When we found out my wife was pregnant, it was like we just died laughing because it was like way late, and we were not expecting it. And uh, but he has been the biggest blessing. My wife almost passed away after having him because she started in bleeding internally. And God answered that prayer. But since then, you know, my mom came down with ALS, which is Lou Gehrig's disease, mm -hmm. and she passed away at the beginning of this year. And then just issues with family and, and, and things like that. But God used him as this just this little light you know i mean how can you everybody you know he lights up the room and all my kids do but he he god has just used him and uh and so it's been he's just been a blessing to us uh, i've uh <laughs> just mentioned family drama i've yet to meet anybody that doesn't have some sort of crazy family drama in their life that's family like i kind of want to meet someone like where they're like oh yeah we're all just normal <laughs> like, well, that would be abnormal. It's, yeah, it's 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 yet to happen. Yeah, <laughs> there's always some fun, crazy story in there. Um, I mean, if you look at Jesus's family line himself, it was a family drama. Yeah, prostitutes, uh, murderers, craziness. You know, um, we're human, and I think that's what draws us to God because we're so imperfect. Nobody can claim that they're they're anything but sinful. That that's what makes us all the same in a lot of ways. We're just we need him. Yeah, I agree. Um, you've got like thirty thousand kids to pay for college. Um, how, are you, how are you guys handling that pressure? Oh man, With a uh, lot of. Uh, well, like, hey, have you like I guess so, so how does that work with the kids like do you say mom and dad are going to cover college or mom and dad are going to try and cover some college but you're going to have to work through it or you need to go find like 10,000 scholarships or do, I guess maybe does adoption uh, that, it depends like Oklahoma if you adopt some, they'll they'll uh, the kids that are adopted through Oklahoma mm -hmm. they have what right now I don't know if they still offer it but it's Oklahoma Promise so they get they get tuition paid for, oh, which nice. is awesome. So you just got to cover like books and room and board. Yeah, my kids do. Nice. They, they cover that. Um, so that covers two. That covers two. We haven't <laughs> got to the other ones yet. <laughs> so you got five coming. Yeah, five coming. So you know, you just pick the one you think is going to do the best. And, uh, <laughs> throw know. your money there. I don't know. Uh, we'll get there when we get okay. there. You haven't saved any uh, college fund yet, then? Um, we don't really have, like, specific budgets and stuff like that. We uh, we save and we invest mm -hmm. and stuff like that, but it's not segregated out. Okay. If that makes any sense. Because I, um, I don't know if what we do is a, is a Florida thing or if it's nationwide. We do the 529. So it's like a, it's a, so it's a college. It's actually a higher learning vessel. Um, it's kind of like you know a Roth IRA or a four hundred one k or something like that, but it's just for college expenses and higher education. So you could use it for like vocational schools, yeah, anything that's higher education. If you want to go to uh, become a nurse or whatnot, or fireman uh, or mechanic. Uh, but what I liked about that is you can pick the investments in it. So you can, you know, you're not stuck with just some stuff that grows like 2% a year. You can actually put some like really good growth stuff in there. Um, and then it's shareable between siblings. So if the oldest, you know, decides not to go to college, because I'm actually not that big on college. So yeah. I went for two years, dropped out. Um, then life's done pretty good. Um, and I was really not um, thrilled with my two years of college. I thought they were kind of... I didn't learn anything amazing. It was just more math, yeah. more English, more history, psychology, sociology. Um, um, you know, obviously it's different if you want to be a doctor or an engineer or something, but I think the whole plan of, you know, everyone has to go to college in order to be successful in life is just, 
not true. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I think we're seeing that where um, blue collar tradesmen, I've got some friends that are like plumbers and electricians and just make killings. Yeah. Because there's so few of those good ones anymore. And there's just so few of skilled tradesmen because everyone for, you know, our, at least my whole life growing up was, you know, uh, don't make your living this way. Don't make your living with labor. Yeah. You know, you need to get an air conditioned office. And now you got a whole bunch of people that can barely make, you know, barely making anything in an air conditioned office and not happy and miserable nine to five. And yet there's a few guys out there, you know, gluing pipes together, just making absolute killings. Well, uh, I guess kind of our thought process, that's one of the benefits of homeschooling and having a, a family business is our kids, they can work, they work, you know, and make money that way. Mm-hmm. Um, that's true. And also, uh, you can have like what some people call a super senior year of, a, of homeschool where you have light load classes, but you're working a lot right before college, mm-hmm. uh, making, up, making up some money that way. And then the community schools around here, community colleges, you can take the same courses in yeah. high school from junior and senior year that have college credit. Mm-hmm. And, and then if you combine that with clepping out of uh, classes, taking tests to basically clep out of classes, you can have a semester or more done even before you start college. Yeah. And uh, it depends. I mean, which I think is super smart. It I, really I've heard is. a few stories of that. I mean, because it's free. Yeah. When you're, but yeah, you you graduate high school and have you know a year, if not more, um, of college under your belt. It's uh, that's pretty impressive. And then community colleges, I think in general, are a smart move if you're going to go the college route, especially if cost is a concern because they're stupid cheap. But everyone wants to go to you know the big school. What here is it? Oklahoma or Oklahoma State? Yeah. Everyone wants to go to the big school and get the college experience, which. Everything you I've still seen, can. You still can, but it, you know, if you go to the the community college route, you can transfer after two years. Yeah. Well, that's and, what I'm saying. You do those last two years where. Yeah. Because the first two years, you're just not learning anything that important. Well, it's, it's the same. It's an expensive two years of learning yes. because what what a lot of kids do is they skip class, and they yeah. they party. Hundred percent. And uh, and so it's a burn. And they get the college it. experience, which is getting drunk and having sex. And so, that's what the parents are taking out loans for. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, uh, this is expensive prostitution. Yeah. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! But at some point, it's kind of like when they get to a certain age, you're like, man, I you you can't. I don't know if you can stay here another semester. You just you. They get in this mindset where. You know, it's when the dad starts saying, uh, you know, if you live under this roof, you got to abide by my rules. And Mm -hmm. basically, if you got to say that, it's almost too late. You know, I mean, it's kind of like they already know that they're they're just disobeying the rules because that's what they want to do. And and so it's it's about time for them to spread their wings by that point. You know, I moved out when I was 16 Um, and. uh yeah, it makes you grow up pretty quick. Yeah. When you when you have to take care of yourself. <laughs> and there's just there's really no other option. Yeah. Which I don't think it's a terrible thing. I don't think it's like the recommended course for everybody. Um, you're working on the app. So so is that all you so you just have some properties and you get to do the app and fly well, the you're, drone and you're you're uh yeah, I'll fly the drone. I am making a killing on the drone. <laughs> <laughs> well you get to fly it for fun. Yeah, uh, you're in Oklahoma, so which you knew that, but it, it's huge petroleum, you know, oil and natural gas. Oh, yeah. And so that's tanked, and we go through this like every 10 years or something like that, but... And that tank, because of this year, everyone stopped driving, and then gas went negative for a while, or... Well, it kind of almost even before that, it started to, um, and then, and then it just, it just went to pot and so all you know any property that you have I, you know the the tenants are moving out they're they mm-hmm. quit paying or they're they don't need it anymore or or whatever and so you're sitting around with empty buildings and empty buildings don't pay money you sure. know so um oklahoma it'll bounce back you know i've heard people say no it's it's gonna go electric and all that kind of stuff 
it always does this you not, know not anytime soon yeah it, it always does this uh so i'm i'm hoping it's going to bounce back when once the market gets a little more stable but until then you know it's slim picking so i've got to come up with different ways to make money and uh I had time on my hands and I'm kind of a computer guy and programmer and things like that. So I made that app. So the app, um, is it like a free app and then you make money off of advertising or, or things you buy within the app? Yeah, it's a free app. So when I was growing, when, you know, growing up and 10, about 10, till about 10 years ago, our family business was trucking and we sold rolls of carpet mm -hmm. and, and vinyl. And so back then I was, you know, trying to come up with some marketing type campaign. And so I made this game. And if you buy different rolls of carpet, you get tickets for this prize. And we gave away leather couches and TVs and stuff like that. And I called it Roll of Fortune. That was like 11 years ago. And, uh, and everybody loved it. They loved the game because they, it was like one carpet dealer play, playing against another one. And they could see who won. You know, it was just kind of like a intertwined between the the you know almost like a camaraderie and competition against different dealers and stuff like that and so um i thought you know what people really like that game and so i made an app for it to where any business could use it you know you can create your own game within the app hmm. and have your clients or your customers play it have your own set of prizes and then the way I make money on it is you, you get free tickets every day and you, there's a bunch of ways to get free tickets. But if you want to buy extra, then, then in the app, there's like in-app purchases and stuff like that, that you can buy extra and stuff like that. Okay. But it's like a, a wheel you spin and you get points, you can go bankrupt. But the intriguing side of it is you don't just spin the wheel. You can also try to do double or nothing you know, where you, you know, it's like a 50, 50 chance of doubling your points, or there's a one in 10 where you could get 10 times the points, but you have 90% chance of going bankrupt. Okay. Stuff like that where, uh, you know, my kids like to play it. Sure. So, uh, it was something fun and something I really wanted to do. I never created an app before. Did you code that or did you hire out the code? I coded it, did the artwork, except for the Panda. My sister-in-law did that. Uh, there's a little panda that pops up and stuff like that and uh did the server the database uh everything i i used to work at a bank and was over the internet banking so i learned a lot about internet and servers and stuff there and then uh, took some classes at a community college on uh, how to code and stuff like that and so um, this year's been really a learning year i learned a different language coding language and and stuff like that um but i got to put a lot of things together that i've i'd always learned that I ha i'd learned previously and they all just kind of came together and uh so it's fun i actually built it for my church youth group that was uh we we had a game and if they brought a bible they get they get certain uh tickets and if they bring friends they get certain things and if they bring uh if they do bible memory they get certain things. But since COVID happened, a lot of kids aren't coming to church. Yeah. So this is a way where they can still play the game and, uh, and play with their friends, but, but from home. And so that's kind of one of the reasons that I did that. So hmm. the bad part is, uh, is that Apple categorized it as simulated gambling. So I'm not really sure how that's gonna go over in church. <laughs> Google says it's rated E for everybody. But Apple was the stickler on How that. About one. that, so did you? Because um, most people, when they write a program, um, what is it they always say? Um, we know Android is a predominant uh, mobile platform, but uh, most of our customers happen to be Apple customers. So we're going to release it on Apple first, and then we'll get the Android. And so every company said the same thing, and we all know it's because it's easier to code for Apple, and it's harder to code for all the different versions of Android. Um, That's interesting. I hadn't heard that. Um, I'd always just oh kind of thought of, of Apple as like this gold standard. If you can get it past their review process, then you can do get it past uh, Google's, which mm -hmm. I found to be kind of true because Apple like rejected it, rejected it, rejected oh, really? it. 
because you know of some of their protocol it wasn't really anything with my coding but they were really picky on certain things and uh and then once i got to google it just kind of it it's still a process but it was it was easier hmm. it was a learning process that's for sure yeah so the different variations um i think of androids different because they have so many different operating systems i guess um what causes issues for like complex apps yeah for, like um, very involved in like banking and things like that yeah uh, we well, have, we'll find out because i'm hoping that it'll be compatible with a lot of different phones and stuff but i may be going through another learning well, curve. if it's simple it's just running algorithms and things like that you might not have to worry about it yeah if it's not like connecting to other things yeah right yeah it, it connects back to my servers okay. but uh hopefully that'll that'll be all right yeah did you go to college? I did. I graduated uh, Oklahoma Wesleyan University Business Administration. Okay. And, uh, yeah, I've thought about going back, you know, and, and things like that, seminary or, or this okay. or that, but uh, I just never, it never, the door never opened wide enough for me, so. I got one of my close friends just keeps going back to school, and I can't figure out why. He's, he's like, he's now a PA. I think he's going to like specialize in something. And his, he, the military is paying for him to do it. So like he yeah. has zero student debt. And oh, that's awesome. Not only gets school paid for it, but gets paid to go to school. Well, there's so, a reason. Right yeah. There. <laughs> um, but, you know, he would also just be a PA or be, you know, there's lots of tracks in the military you can go. Um, I love that about the military. You oh, know, it's a great I, option. Yeah. That's, I mean, like if, if, if money was an issue and your kid wants to be a doctor, Military. Yeah. I mean, uh, I tell my son that I'm like, man, you know, Air Force or, you know, and he, he's been intrigued by it, you know, and, yeah. and so uh, I think that's a great option for some guys. 100%. Um, they're serving the country, you know, at the same time, they're, they're learning the value of uh, freedom. So. Exactly. And they earned an education. Yeah, they're going to get paid, and you know if they're doing it while they're in there, or if it's a career track within, um, you know you can definitely get paid uh, to do it. You know, and then even if you're just you know you do your four years and yeah. serve and get out, and you still have the um, what is that called, the VA benefits. Is that what it is? Is VA yeah VA benefits? So you get four years of college. Okay. And you can either use that yourself, or give it to your spouse, or give it to your kids. You can split it up. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, military takes care of those guys, and they, they definitely should. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's a it's a nice uh, nice little thing he's done of get a check while going to school and accumulating no debt. <laughs> 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 and to the point to where he'll be able to leave, you know, as I don't know if he's going to become a full-fledged doctor or not, um, uh, but he could. He just, then you would get to leave and go into private practice. With zero debts, and he gets a healthy paycheck now. So yeah, I'd, I'd almost think there's very few doctors out there that can go, you know, be a doctor on their own without having oh. a massive amount of debt. It's expensive. Yeah, it's a very long expensive. time to go to school. I um, mean, even if you get schooling paid for, I mean, you've got to like live. So yeah, and it costs to live. Um, and and some people don't think of the cost of you know not having another job that pays you know you're going to school for eight years well that's eight years you could have been working somewhere else making more money yeah and so there's an actual cost there that doesn't add up you know on, in your bank account but it's there yeah it's a lost lost revenue cost no and that's a real real real, real thing um you got nothing else huh I'm trying to think if I got anything. Nothing super. How long has it been? I don't know. Did we get enough on tape? Yeah, we did. Okay, good. We can end it. 9.23. My gosh, yeah, we got plenty. <laughs> <laughs>